welcome to Learning English, a daily 30-minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Ana Mateo. This program is for English learners, so we speak a bit slower. And our stories are written especially for people learning English. The University of California system will continue not to require widely used tests to decide which students it will accept. The nine University of California schools that accept undergraduates will not use the SAT and ACT standardized tests and has no plans to require them in the future. A standardized test is an examination that is given to a large number of people to compare their abilities. There are over 200,000 undergraduate students within the University of California system. An undergraduate is a student who is working toward their first college degree. The well-known schools in the system include the University of California, Berkeley, the University of California, Los Angeles, UCLA, and the University of California, Santa Barbara. The University of California system is run by a board of regents. Most are appointed by the state's governor. In mid-November, the board of regents said it was not able to find a good replacement for the SAT or ACT tests. The group said there would not be a new test anytime soon. Standardized tests have become a subject of debate and legal action in recent years. Part of the dispute has been caused by the COVID-19 pandemic. Many universities decided it would be up to students if they wanted to send test scores with their applications. They are known as test optional schools, meaning the test scores are not required. One of the most well-known schools in this group is the University of Chicago. In the last two years, Colleges and universities reported getting more applications from students in general. They have especially received more applications from the minority groups. Critics say the traditional standardized tests do not predict how well students will do in college. In addition, they say some businesses created costly test preparation classes that not every student can pay for. As a result, they say rich students, especially those who are white or Asian, are in a better position. Supporters of the tests say they help some students who have trouble getting good grades in high school show that they can be good college students. They worry that removing the tests could keep those students from going to good colleges. Two years ago, a group that included the Compton Unified School District in California brought legal action against the University of California system. It called for the universities to remove the test requirement. Compton has many black and Hispanic students who do not apply to competitive colleges. In May 2021, the university reached an agreement with the groups that brought the case. It said it would stop using the SAT and ACT for the four years ending in 2025. It also agreed to pay over $1 million in legal costs. The University of California then decided to study whether the tests permitted the school to bring in a group of diverse and able students each year, 
Their study showed that standardized tests aid in predicting student performance, including their grades. However, the university decided to change its test policies anyway. Over the last year, the study group considered using a test that is given to 11th grade students in California public schools called Smarter Balanced. The idea was to replace the SAT and ACT. Mary Govan, a professor at the University of California, Riverside, was one of the group leaders. At the recent meeting, she said the new test would provide only modest value beyond high school grades in predicting how a student would perform in college. In addition, she said the professors in the study group worried that adding high stakes to the smarter balanced test would lead to companies creating new costly test preparation classes. Michael Brown is a leader of the University of California system called the Provost. He announced the final decision. UC will continue to practice test-free admission now and into the future. With the major universities in California permanently removing the standardized tests, will other universities do the same? Jeremy Bauer Wolf is a reporter for Higher Ed Dive, a website that covers higher education in the U.S. He said he thinks they will. Higher education is very much a case of follow the leader, he said. Colleges don't necessarily always want to act unless they see their peers doing the same thing. The UC system very publicly doing away with these tests will reverberate, uh, especially through California, but, you know, other, other institutions that might be looked as competitive. Bauer Wolf said universities throughout the U.S. have been evaluating test optional admissions during the pandemic. However, he thinks those policies may soon become permanent. Test optional, he notes, is different from removing tests from a student's application. A study released earlier this year looked at test optional admissions starting in 2005. It found schools that made the change did see an increase in first-time minority and women students. Once more schools follow California and drop the test requirement, fewer students will take the tests. That will hurt the companies that produce the tests, Bauer Wolf said. That's something to closely watch, he said. I'm Dan Friedel. Thanks, Dan. Now let's hear from Ashley Thompson. She tells us about the costliest city on the planet. The Israeli city of Tel Aviv is the world's costliest place to live, the Economist Intelligence Unit Research Group says. The EIU released the results of its yearly Worldwide Cost of Living Index on Wednesday. The index is created by comparing prices in U.S. dollars for goods and services in 173 cities. The EIU uses 400 individual prices across 200 products and services to decide the world's costliest and least costly places. It is the first time Tel Aviv has held the index's highest position. Last year, it was in the sixth position. The Israeli city climbed the rankings partly because of the strength of its national money, the shekel, against the dollar. Other reasons were increases in prices for transportation and food. Singapore and Paris came in tied for second followed by the Swiss city of Zurich and Hong Kong. 
Another Swiss city, Geneva, came in seventh. The rest of the top ten costliest cities were Copenhagen, Denmark, Los Angeles, California, and Osaka, Japan. Last year, the EIU index named Paris, Singapore, and Hong Kong in a tie for first place. This year's data was collected in August and September as prices for goods rose. The EIU found that, on average, prices rose 3.5 percent in local currency terms. That is the fastest inflation rate recorded over the past five years. Social restrictions due to the COVID-19 pandemic have disrupted the supply of goods, leading to shortages and higher prices," said Upasana Dutt. She is head of worldwide cost of living at the EIU. We can clearly see the impact in this year's index," Dutt added. The average inflation number does not include four cities with exceptionally high rates. Those cities are Caracas, Venezuela, Damascus, Syria, Buenos Aires, Argentina, and Tehran, Iran. Damascus was ranked the world's least costly city to live in. Tehran, Iran's capital, rose from 79th to 29th in the rankings this year. The sharp rise, the biggest of any city, is due to financial punishments by the United States. Those sanctions have led to higher prices and caused shortages. Rome, Italy, saw the biggest drop in the rankings. It fell from 32nd place last year to 48th place this year. I'm Ashley Thompson. Thanks, Ashley. Dan Novak has our next story about the word of the year. The word "vaccine" can bring out emotions and discussions in ways it never did before the start of the pandemic. In some countries, new variants are spreading as COVID-19 vaccines have yet to arrive. In others, shots are wasted as citizens fight against the government's vaccination requirements. Vaccine has come to represent not just scientific progress, but also political divisions around the world. That is why two major dictionary publishers have chosen "vaccine" and "vax" as the 2021 words of the year. Peter Sokolowski is an editor with American dictionary publisher Merriam-Webster. He told the Associated Press the word "vaccine" represents two stories. One is the science story, which is this remarkable speed with which the vaccines were developed. But there's also the debates regarding policy, politics, and political affiliation. It's one word that carries these two huge stories, he said. Lookups or searches for the word "vaccine" increased 1,048 percent on Merriam-Webster's website from 2019 to 2021. Debates over who is able to get the vaccine, vaccine requirements, and additional shots kept interest high. Sokolowski said. So did concern about the safety of the vaccines and vaccine passports. Although people looked up the word on the internet a lot all year, searches rose 535 percent in August, Merriam-Webster said. At that time, there was a lot of news about vaccine requirements and vaccination rates, the publisher said. Across the Atlantic Ocean, Britain's Oxford English Dictionary named "vax" as its word of the year for 2021. Vax is an informal word that can mean the noun vaccine or the verb vaccinate. Researchers at the Oxford University Press released a report about how vaccine affected the English language over the past year. The report said it is rare for a subject to affect language so much in such a short period of time.
Vaccine comes from the Latin word vaca, which means cow. The word was first used to describe inoculation. That word described a process of using small amounts of cowpox to prevent smallpox, explained Merriam-Webster on its website. In English, the word vaccine started being used in the 1880s. Some say the word vax started to appear in the 1980s. Oxford researchers found that the word was not used often until this year. By September, vax was being used over 72 times more often than at the same time last year. Vax is used in informal ways, in terms such as vax sites and to get vaxxed. The word anti-vaxxer refers to a person who is against receiving a vaccine. Last year, Merriam-Webster chose pandemic as the word of the year. It had the highest number of lookups on Merriam-Webster's website in 2020. The company bases its choice on searches, paying close attention to large increases. The company has been naming a word of the year since 2008. Britain's Cambridge Dictionary chose the word perseverance as the 2021 word of the year. Perseverance is a continued effort to do something, even when it is difficult or takes a long time. The word perfectly captures the undaunted will of people across the world to never give up, despite the many challenges of 2021, Cambridge said on its website. Lookups of the word also greatly increased in February, when NASA's Perseverance rover landed on Mars. Collins Dictionary, however, selected NFT, which has nothing to do with the pandemic, as its word of the year. NFT is a short form for the words non-fungible token. The term means a unique electronic identifier that records ownership of electronic property. NFTs have grown in popularity in 2021. I'm Dan Novak. Thanks, Dan. Special kind of Christmas tree from John Russell. Every year, workers put up a big, freshly cut evergreen tree in a historic building in Asbury Park, New Jersey, to celebrate Christmas. The Grand Arcade at the Convention Hall rises above the town's boardwalk, a walking path along the Atlantic Ocean. But recently workers put up a very different kind of Christmas tree in the arcade. Unlike an evergreen, it requires little care and can never die. That is because the 2021 Christmas tree is made wholly of a thick and strong paper material called cardboard. When the winter holidays end, the tree is to be recycled. The tree's creators sought to honor elements of Asbury Park's natural environment, cityscape, and rich musical history. Opinions on the tree are mixed. I like that it's different. It's pretty interesting, said local man Chris Trafari. He lives in Neptune, a neighboring town. Local Elizabeth Kimmich offered similar praise. I think it's very creative. She had come to the Grand Arcade to take pictures of her dogs in front of the tree. Others on the boardwalk were not as pleased by the tree. Anthony Solomondo said it looked like an Amazon package. Not a fan, added Amy Mackey. Asbury has conformed into this artsy town, but tradition is tradition. This is art, and I wouldn't take my child's picture in front of this tree. Can't we just have our traditional tree? The change came about this year when the city's art community contacted Madison Marquette, the private owner of the Asbury Park boardwalk. They asked about creating a Christmas tree sculpture for Convention Hall, said Austin Leopold, the manager of the property. 
Leopold said the property company passionately embraced the idea for the sculpture. He said it honors the boardwalk's image as a center for Asbury Park's arts and music community. Michael Lavallee, a local artist who goes by the name Porkchop, created the piece with Brad Hoffer. They call it The Giving Tree. He said the company told him there would not be a natural Christmas tree at Convention Hall this year. I was asked to come in and do something festive-ish, said Porkchop. Festive means celebratory, especially in connection with a holiday. Porkchop said he did not want to take away anyone's Christmas tree. He added, If you're not going to give people the big tree they want, some of them are going to hate it. I understand that. But they weren't going to get that traditional Christmas tree anyway. The piece uses natural and artificial lighting to darken parts of the tree while shining light on others. In this way, the piece's appearance changes throughout the day. Amy Quinn is Asbury Park's deputy mayor. Quinn said that the city is not involved in the convention hall decisions, but that she likes the piece. I love the take that the local artists had on the tree, she said. I love that it's different. Love it or hate it, people are talking about it. I'm John Russell. Thanks for that story, John. Personally, I would love to see a cardboard Christmas tree. Our last story is from Brian Lynn. He reports on a campaign to increase Mandarin learners. China has launched a campaign to get 85% of its citizens using Mandarin, the country's national language, by 2025. The Chinese government recently issued an order calling for the campaign. The move is likely to put threatened dialects and languages in the country under greater pressure. These include Cantonese and Hokkien, as well as the minority languages of Tibetan, Mongolian, and Uyghur. The order said that the use of Mandarin, known in Chinese as Putangwa, or the common tongue, remains unbalanced and inadequate. The government said the national language needs to be improved to meet the demands of a modern economy. In the past, critics have protested changes to the education system as well as employment requirements that have lessened the importance of minority languages. The critics have said such efforts appear to be an attempt to get rid of cultures that do not fit in with the majority Han Chinese ethnic group. Along with the 2025 goal, the government's policy aims to make Mandarin mostly universal by 2035. This means it seeks to include people in rural areas as well as ethnic minorities. One protest over government attempts to increase the use of Mandarin was held last year in Inner Mongolia. The protest came after officials replaced the Mongolian language with Mandarin as the official language of instruction. China's ruling Communist Party has denounced such protests as a form of separatism and moved to end them quickly. The language campaign includes legal requirements. A document explaining the policy demanded strengthened supervision to ensure that the national common spoken and written language is used as the official language of government agencies. 
the document added that Mandarin should also be used as the basic language of schools, news and publications, radio, film and television, public services, and other fields. The policy also calls on officials to enhance the international status and influence of Chinese in education, international organizations, and at worldwide gatherings. The Chinese government has sought to increase the teaching of Mandarin through its worldwide network of Confucius Institutes. Critics have denounced the efforts as an attempt to push the party's policies and block discussion of sensitive subjects, such as China's human rights record. I'm Brian Lin. Thanks, Brian. And that is our show for today. Thank you for listening. Some content in this program was provided by the Associated Press or Reuters News Agency. And don't forget to join us again tomorrow to learn English through stories from around the world. I'm Ana Mateo.